my goodness. Hi, everybody. Uh, well, well, well. So, I'm a bit discombobulated today. How is that different from other lives? It's not different from other lives. Will this be working today? We don't know. Last month didn't work great, so I'm not sure whether this month is gonna work all right or not, or if in general people are just off lives and out having a lark because it's the spring. I'm not sure, but I'm seeing some eyeballs, so some of you are there. Hello! Yay! Excellent! As ever, please tell me if you feel like it, uh, where you're tuning in from, so I can get excited about my global reach. <laughs> I have global reach, everybody. Hi! So today, it's very warm in here, as you may or may not be able to tell by the fact that I am uh, a little glowy. Um, anyway. Uh, it's quite warm in my apartment. I'm not in the office. I'm in the apartment. This is uh, our future uh, since I'm closing down the office slowly but surely over the next couple of months. Um, hello, hello, hello. I'm seeing familiar faces. Excellent. So today, because it is warm, I am drinking iced tea. I know, but it does happen. However, for anybody who's from the South, I'm not drinking your iced tea. Uh, I'm actually drinking unsweetened iced tea. I prefer my iced tea unsweetened. And I'm like my iced tea is really kind of complex. So today, this is an iced puer, and it is the Grand Arbiter's Existential Despair, which is a puer from Tea Punk Teas, who also make my oolong tea, which is also very good iced. But this one, I don't know. I. Puer is a very earthy one. I don't love puer in general, but this one has sort of brandy and plummy notes to it. So it's very, like I said, complex and really delicious iced. And so yes, the Grand Arbiter's Existential Despair. I recommend it. Uh, I think I felt like it because I had Korean food for lunch, which is a very earthy, Korean food has a lot of kind of funky notes, especially me who likes all the fermented and pickled things and I like lots of extra gochujang and stuff. So. I think puer and Korean food go really, really well together. I am full of extremely odd pairings like this. I, I, I have to say, I also really love German, not sweet Rieslings and Thai food. So Trokan Rieslings or half Trokan Rieslings and Thai food. Um, I think that's a match made in heaven. So yeah, I'm full of like very strange <laughs> combinations. So. Yes, today we are having a puer, everybody. Uh, let me know if you're joining me in a drink of any kind, whether it is tea or something stronger or something weaker. <laughs> Harrogate, my goodness. Um, the next order of business is to tell you what I'm wearing on my lips. I'm saying these things simply because these are the questions I always get out the front. So today I'm testing a new lipstick I love the feel of it. it. It kind of acts like a lip balm, but it moves all over the place. So I, I'm not sure it's gonna like stick in my rotation for public appearances anyway. I might just wear it on walking around. Um, it is, uh, oh, <laughs> why don't I show it to you? Tower 28, I like this brand a lot. Um, I really love their mascara. They're a Korean brand. And um, yeah, it is, it's their only red. They only have like four colors. I can't remember what it's called. It's called something weird, like a juice balm, but uh, it's basically a crayon style. Um, so yeah, there it is. Now we've, we've done the important bits. Um, <laughs> yeah, the important things, what's on my lips and what am I ingesting? Um, so today I thought we would have a conversation about life as a traveling author as the convention season is opening up. Um, I'm hoping you have some questions for me about this aspect of life, what it's like to be an author on the go. I do a lot of traveling as an author. I do more than a lot of authors I know, I think. Um, my goodness, everybody's tuning in from all over the place. It's so cool. Um, yes, yeah, speaking of all over the place, I've done conventions all over the place at this juncture. So in general, us authors, or at least me, uh, tend to think of uh, different kinds of events. So you have something like a book tour, which usually you're, you can do it for yourself, but more commonly your publisher puts you on a book tour. And I always joke when I say that a book tour tells you that the author is big enough to warrant a book tour, but 
not so big that they can't say no to a book tour because they're rough on the soul and the body. Um, there's a, sorry, there's a weird thing on my phone. Anyway, um, book tours are, are, are challenging, shall we say. Um, they're usually like 10 cities in 10 days kind of deal. So you, you like fly in at the mornings and then you check into your hotel and then if you're me you change and you put on your makeup and then you go to the event and then you try to fit in some food in there and then you go back to your hotel and then you go to sleep and then you wake up the next morning very very early and then you catch the next flight ad nauseum um, and the reason they try and do it so many so fast is because they're trying to get on like the New York Times list and stuff like that and that is because when you're doing a book tour the bookstore guarantees to buy in enough books to satisfy all of the fans who are going to come out to the uh, meet the author at the author event and that increases the sales of the book during the first two weeks that the book is on sale and that's important because it's usually if a book is going to hit like the new york times it's going to take a lot of activity and enthusiasm during those first two weeks that's kind of the window you have to hit it if you're if you're not like a huge name author so that's what book tours are like. So I actually don't really do book tours anymore. Occasionally I'll do like a book tourish sort of thing where I'm going to an area. So I'll try to also organize a signing at a bookstore, which is a little bit like a book tour, but it's just me doing maybe one or two bookstores in a, in a, in a drivable distance or something like that. Um, so that's the second kind of event then is like bookstore events. And for me at this point, it's usually because I'm in the area for something else. So like I've gone up there to teach at a conference or I'm attending a convention and I'll try to do a bookstore event as well. Cause if I'm flying up there on my own dime, it doesn't matter to me. Um, if the convention is flying me and putting me up and I'm the guest of honor, then I'm a reason for people to attend to the convention. So I don't do a bookstore event because that would divide the audience. So just to be polite to the organizers. But if I'm paying like at a Comic-Con or something, I'll try to organize a, um, a convention, a, a, a bookstore signing nearby, if the bookstore will have me. The bookstores are getting more and more reluctant to do author events. I don't know why, it's just the way the world is changing. So that's the, the second kind of thing is like a, just a bookstore signing and that's just me chipping into town. Uh, bookstores are also doing like author panel signings and authors so like they'll get a different bunch of authors who are in the same genre and they'll do a signing together so that's kind of fun when those roll into town. Then the next kind of event I've already mentioned and that's a conference. So when I say I'm going to a conference that usually means it's a teaching event so that means it's for writers so I'm there to do lectures and teach you usually about the business of writing, some craft stuff. I'll usually do the heroine's journey as like a lecture or something. So that's like, and that basically means you're in a hotel for, from the traveling side of the equation, it means you're in a hotel for two or three nights, sometimes more. Most up to four, four nights is the, I think the most I've done. Um, so those are teaching conferences or writer conferences or business conferences and usually that's something where they've brought me in as a special guest lecturer of some kind which means they're they're covering everything um and then the next is conventions so and conventions come in small medium and large um size wise so a small convention is um you know something or anything under like 500 people a lot a, a medium convention is around a thousand uh, to 2,000 and then a bigger convention can get up to five to 10,000. There aren't very many of those. And then there's Comic Cons, which are a whole different sort of kettle of fish. They're like pop culture conventions and they can be huge, huge. So, you know, 20,000 to 150,000, like they're just ginormous. So, and the, so those are the different kinds of conventions. Um, there's not as many conventions now as there used to be, but there still are some around. And usually if I'm the guest of honor, it means the convention has invited me down and is putting me up and, and spoiling me. It's great to be a guest of honor at a convention. Um, and I'm happy to do any size. I love all the different size of conventions. The smaller conventions, you have a more chance, like you'll see me at like the, the convention, um, what's it called? The green room or the con suite. You'll see me hanging out and you just come up and say hi. Um, I like to socialize at conventions a lot more than a lot of other authors do. So you'll see me hanging out in the bar and always come up and say hi when I'm at a convention. Um, at the larger conventions, there'll be something called an author bar, which is where all of us authors go to hang out after hours. And there's also green rooms, which are closed to the public. So they're places where we 
decompress before we go our, and be on panels and stuff like that. So, you know, a little bit like kind of medium sized conventions would be something like World Con or World Fantasy. Um, and then there's the big ones like Comic Cons, which I'll also do. Those are a lot. <laughs> they take a lot out of you, especially someone like me. I, I'm social, but I am an introvert and I am a little bit crowd phobic. So I don't like huge crowds. They make me really nervous. Um, so it takes a lot for me to gear up for a Comic-Con of any kind, but I do like some of them and I can talk to you if you're interested in which ones I like the best and things like that. I'm happy to <laughs> name names. <laughs> um, and then there's international conventions, which tend to be the medium size, um, the, but there are very much fewer of them. Each country in Europe, for example, may have one or maybe two. And then after conventions and conferences comes book fairs and festivals. So those are often open to the public um, and they're a lot of fun. They're really well attended, but they are different. Sometimes they have some panels attached and often you're like behind a booth or with, a, you know, you're signing at different um, booths and you're maybe doing one or two panels. They're, they're different book fairs and festivals. I like them a lot because it's a chance for me to meet people outside of genre. Um, and, and recruit them to, this, to the genre side, ruthlessly using my humor uh, to pull in new readers. So I do like book fairs and festivals. I think they're a lot of fun, but they tend to be really trad oriented. So they only really want you if you have a newer release from a traditional publisher, which I haven't had a new release from a traditional publisher in a while. So um, they're not wild to have me these days. And yeah, I think that's most of them. So those are all the different kinds of conventions and things that I do or have done or will do in the future. Um, I tend to pick and choose based on, oh, steampunk events. Sorry, how could I forget? Steampunk events. So steampunk events are conventions, but they're specifically for steampunk and cosplay. So they're a little bit less reader oriented and a little bit more uh, fashion and technology oriented. And they're lots of fun as well. But um, I also go to those and I dress up. I do all the dressing up. It's lots of fun. I love a I love a steampunk event because I get to pull out all the stops in the clothing department. It's the, one of the few events I, I I actually check a bag. Most of the time I, I like to fly carry on, but but for a steampunk event, I need all my corsets. We're checking. Uh, it's important to take all of the things and look fabulous. Um, yeah. So th those are all the things I do. I do a lot apparently. Um, I come out of conventions, so I first went to, I think they were called Creation. I can't remember what they were called, but like Star Trek events. So I was a big Trekkie in high school. So my first, my very first conventions were Star Trek conventions, um, Next Generation. And then I went to lo our local um, small convention, which was actually a medium-sized convention when I was a teenager, and that was Baycon here in California. Um, it was about two to 5,000 people back in the day, in the heyday. Um, and I loved that convention and um, that was like my growing pains convention. That's where I would cosplay as a big, as a big fangirl. I used to love to go to cons as, as an attendee. And then my first large writer con was actually a world con in Boston. So that was my first like big event that I flew for. And again, that was before I was published or anything that was just in my fangirl days. So I come to conventions, honestly, I swear. Uh, but I always knew that I was gonna want to do conventions as a professional author. So it was always something that I built in as desirable as far as I'm concerned. Like the opportunity to meet you, the opportunity to travel, and to talk about this thing that I do that I love so much. Like conventions to me seem like a win-win. Um, and I am also one of those weird authors who's social. So I like meeting other authors and talking to them. And at this point I like, you know, meeting newer authors and trying to help them out getting started um, as much as as much as I feel able so yeah there it is that is travel so um oh people are saying how pleased they are to have met me at convention so yeah put it in the comment if you've actually met me at an event that would be awesome um Suzanne says they were at the last Portland, Oregon bookstore visit. Yay! Yes, I had such a good time. Uh, Portland fandom is such a reader-oriented place, and um, it's it was it's been seven years I realized since I've done a Portland event, and I have to say, you guys are still bringing it. You haven't changed that much in Portland. Everybody's still 
asking great questions, super excited to be there, really pleased to meet an author. So I was delighted to see everyone who came out. Um, and it was great because the bookstore we were in, in um, Milwaukee, which is just outside of Portland, uh, they were just the nicest people. They, they're, it's a baby new bookstore and it's queer owned and run and they were just total sweethearts. We were their first author event. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it was, it was charming. Um, all right. I am, Ooh, I'm looking for, Oh, there's a question from where do virtual appearances fit in? Well, that's interesting. Cause here's the thing. I started doing these lives well before lockdown, um, just as a means because I kept, because people know I travel a lot and yet I still get people saying, when are you going to come to New Zealand or Australia or places that are that are a lot harder for me to get to, quite frankly. So um, I started doing these lives and then reposting them to YouTube so people could have access to me and ask me questions and say hi and stuff like that. But I didn't have to fly all the way there and I didn't have to try to get everywhere all at once. And um, I, at first I started them just for like book launches and stuff. Uh, but I didn't really think of them as events in the same way as I think about travel events. Like for travel events are like this, the live, I just set it up. I get gussied up and I sit and I chat with you guys. So at most it eats like two or three hours out of my day. A travel event eats most of a week usually, usually a whole week because I have to pack and organize and get everything settled. That almost takes me a whole day ahead of time. And then I, I need to decompress for at least a day. I'm definitely an introvert in terms of like, it saps my energy. So when I come home, I need to like kind of lock it down and just veg on the couch for a while. So, so I didn't think about virtual events as events until lockdown. And so I, during lockdown, I amped up how many lives I did because I was, you know, trying to stay in touch with people and stay in contact with everybody and make sure you guys knew that I was still around and I still cared. And then yeah so so and that's when we also started to have the seed change where we started to think about virtual events and and think in terms of conventions being online and stuff like that so and it's it's that has ever been evolving so i've done a couple of like online convention events and then i've a couple of other sort of virtual things as well as these lives um and now people are like doing things where i'm like pre-recording for events so I'm not actually there. I don't have to show up at a time and place or I can show up after and answer questions or something. So, you know, it, it seems to be still changing as kind of that's, so that's where virtual appearances fit in is like they don't seem to in my brain, in my brain that loves a spreadsheet and loves an Excel and loves to categorize things. I haven't really categorized them yet in the events arena because I they don't seem to have settled into a standard of any kind as yet and they always take place on different platforms so it's not like they're all zoom or something and that is maddening for somebody like me who is very bad with technology and it hates learning a new thing um, and it seems to me every virtual convention I do there's a new weird uh, setup to execute this convention that I have to figure out and the buttons are all in the wrong place and oh, it's like me and Facebook all over again <sighs> I'm scrolling back to see if there are any earlier questions in amongst everybody chittering about what we're drinking and what we're eating. It looks like not. So if I, if you dropped a question super early on and I've missed it, go ahead and just redo it, please. Remember to please put the question mark at the beginning. So I know that it's a question. Um, welcome to those of you who are just joining. Uh, we are talking about traveling and doing events as an author and for, with somebody who's done too many probably. Bill asks, for an unknown author, how valuable is hitting a few small or medium conventions every year on one's own dime? Um, uh, and I can't, I'm trying to see more. Oh, there we go. Um, how valuable is hitting a few new small or medium conventions every year on one's own dime to try and gain readers? I'm glad you specified. I think that the value in, in attending small to medium conventions early on is not in gaining readers as a newer author. It's actually in networking with other authors. You're more likely, especially at the smaller cons, to meet whoever the headliner is in person 
and learns from authors who are further along in their career, but also establish a network. So, and I would be strategic. So if the author who's headlining, who's presumably the draw for that convention is not in your genre, then it's maybe not worth, not gonna be worth your time to A, network with them, but also try and get some of their readers on board because those aren't your readers. Um, so that's one thing I would think about when you're picking what to do. The other thing is expense. So, I mean, when I was first starting out and I didn't have much money to spend on travel, I only drove to local conventions. So I did things that kind of were within my reach. So all I had to do was come up with the attendance and the hotel room. And I often would split the hotel room with a bunch of other authors <laughs> or friends. So, you know, and, and I mean a bunch, like this was back in my my 20s so you know there'd be like 11 of us in one room and we had like a big tip jar where anybody who wanted to contribute to the room could but we weren't gonna pressure you to do so um, and whoever had the best job was the one who was like paying for the hotel room so sometimes it was me sometimes it was one of my best friends depending on who was holding basically to use the British word so yeah um, so, but, but the green room at these conventions where there's only you know, maybe 10 to 12 other authors, that is really valuable. Um, it's just an opportunity to get FaceTime with other writers to learn what their process is like, to get tips and tricks. I, I mean, I have a blog post, which is not one of the ones I thought I would talk about or link, but it's basically um, 10 authors who helped me at, at the beginning of my career. Um, so people who very early on and just before I, I sold Zolas were just instrumental and all every single one of them I met at a convention. So in that regard, like I, I don't think there's a whole psychological component to being an author because we're so isolated all the time and having author friends, face to face author friends, not just virtual author friends that bolster you, people who you're going to keep meeting at other conventions regularly is just it's it's indescribably vital like I would not be a sane human being if I didn't have my author friends if I didn't have people who have been with me since early on in my career and have been on similar career paths but also people who are slightly ahead of me I just you you need people to call on and you may not make a best friend at that first convention but the third or the fourth convention you might and, and that author friend might be there for life. So, or at least for your author career. And yeah, I mean, I can name some of them for you. You've, you've heard me name drop many of my super close author friends, but these are friends who, you know, when I'm having a contract problem and, you know, yes, my agent is awesome, but sometimes I need to call another author who's dealing with a similar contract or who I know is at a similar state in their career and be like, what did you manage to get out of this publisher? Uh, like, should I knuckle under under these things? Or is my agent right? Sometimes you just need to bounce. And, and there's also the idea side of the equation. Sometimes you need authors who you can just take a walk on a beach with and bounce some ideas or some thoughts off of in terms of a new series you might want to pitch or a character issue or what have you. So, you know, having different authors that satisfy different aspects of your career who you can call on is also really good. And I should say, like, it is give and take. I am called on as well and have been many, many times. Um, you know, you, you, it's, it's a, it's a relationship. <laughs> it's a professional relationship. These are your coworkers, basically. Um, yeah, so for me, that was the most valuable thing about attending conventions early on. I don't know of any, you know, early readers I got at cons. Um, maybe. Maybe some of you saw me at the very, very, very beginning. Uh, my first, one of my first conventions as Gail was probably a world con or a world fantasy. Um, yeah. So not a, not like, maybe not stellar for readers, uh, but, but pretty good for meeting authors and networking. Excuse me for a second. My earbuds are beeping at me. Okay. <laughs> you probably couldn't hear that. Um, excellent question. Thank you for that. Um, oh, somebody says lovely in pink. Thank you. Yes, this is, uh, I, this is my spring, uh, look, my spring pink look. Um, I, you know, I made my peace with pink. I didn't love pink, um, early on. I was a tiny bit of a goth kid and I thought I was too tough for pink, but it does look good on me. So it is warm though. 
I'm also pink because I'm flushed. <sighs> Jesse wants to know if there's a live Discord. You know, there is a Gail Carriger Discord, but I have no idea what's going on with it. I don't even know how to get to it. I didn't know Discord did lives. Um, sure, anything's possible. A live YouTube has been possible. Uh, the aforementioned me, terrible at technology and very reluctant to try a new platform. But the way Facebook is going these days, there's a good chance they will just kill the live. I can't imagine they're making any kind of money off of these lives, so I would suspect them of wanting to do away with that feature um, because they don't like it. If they can't make money, if they can't advertise on it, they're not interested. Um, so I am in ever great anticipation of this being unsupported or just becoming terrible or getting trolled or something. I don't know. Um, in which case, I'm happy to jump. I've thought about Twitch as well. Um, the problem with both of these is you, my people, tend to be on Facebook. It's where my Facebook group is and everybody seems to still be hanging out on Facebook. Um, people haven't like sort of large scale jumped ship to any other platform as yet. So, but yeah, I'm, I mean, Discord, I don't know. I'm not wild about Discord, but again, I've been on Discord in years, so. Um, but if us, the collective, decides we need to try somewhere else, I'd be happy to try somewhere else. Why not? SH Klein asks, have I ever been to Bubonicon? I've heard about it um, in Albuquerque. I have heard about it. Um, yes, but I'm not local to New Mexico. Um, so, uh, yeah, no. Tell them to invite me. This is the other thing, is just, like, push. They listen to you guys, right? Um, they listen to it like publishers. Publishers listen to readers. It's a great secret. Write to a publisher. Um, if you want someone's attention, write to publishers and tell them to acquire this author or how much you love so-and-so. Uh, don't tell us. I mean, I love hearing it, of course. I love being told that, <laughs> that my books are great and you love them. Of course I do. Um, but I don't have very much clout with my publisher. Whereas readers have an inordinate amount of clout with publishers. Same thing with convention organizers. They listen to the attendees. If you want an author brought in, me or somebody else, make some noise with the convention and see if you can get them to bring you in. Um, yeah. Mostly, I don't travel to go to smaller or medium-sized conventions. I wait to be asked. I'm like a vampire. I, I prefer an invitation. Uh, the only conventions where I take pains to travel to on my own dime are things like Worldcon, and then usually because it's in a place I want to go to, and frankly, it's mostly because it's larger and my friends are there. So I have all of these author friends now, and the collective us doesn't all get together very often, except at, at like a Worldcon. So I'm actually mostly doing things like Worldcons to see my friends, my author friends, also to see all the people who turn up, of course. But yeah, it's different wherever it goes in Worldcon's case. So that's, that's really, that's secretly why I really do it. Um, you know, all of these author friends I've made over the years that I was talking about, like we very rarely see each other now because we're all 15 years in and busy authors, busy authoring. Um, yeah, but that I've heard about the one in Albuquerque and I would love to go. Um, my Wayback Machine hat, has just gone on. I used to work in the Four Corners region when I was archaeology. So my, hold on, second to last study field when I was working on my second master's degree pursuant to the PhD, I did Four Corners research. So I was fingerprinting um, galena, which is a mineral that was used is, as glaze paint in, um, in that region. Uh, and I was interested in whether they were um, trading that the raw material itself or whether just the pots were moving from place to place so very brief glimpse of the path so i'm very uh passionate about that area from a historical <laughs> perspective um, and i think it's a beautiful part of the world so i'd love to go there and I, I haven't been to new mexico in ages oh someone's very kindly asked about the popster um my father uh he's actually he's on an upswing at the moment which is very nice um you know when you're that old you have Crests and valleys, right? There are good days and bad. There are good weeks and bad. Um, my dad is 90, everybody, and um, I'm, I'm kind of, a, I'm his sole caregiver, basically. He doesn't live with me, we don't live together. He still lives independently. 
Um, but we're, we're doing well at the moment. Um, the collective us has figured out uh, grocery delivery. Very exciting. And cause, uh, cause we lost the car keys recently. Uh, he should, he can't, he can't be driving anymore. <laughs> um, so yeah, so grocery delivery is happening. Um, that was fun. Again, techno neophobe did not do grocery delivery during lockdown. Um, so had to learn how to do it at last. And yeah, he has, um, so he has a neighbor who, uh, who checks in on him regularly. Um, so two couple times a day and he has a girlfriend who checks in on him pretty regularly. And between the two of them, he's doing pretty good. And I go up there a lot now. Um, which, which does take up some time, but you know, I'm also his landlady now, so I gotta go do yard work. Um, I'm, you can probably tell from my facial, this is not, this is, does this look like somebody who does yard work? Uh, no, thank you, but I'm doing it. I should get very fit. I, I wear gloves. Um, not, not, not Gale gloves. I wear, not vintage gloves. I wear gardening gloves, uh, little rubber ones. And that, yes, and I pull weeds and everything. It's, uh, it's startling, <laughs> but I can do it. But yes, dad's doing, dad's doing pretty good. The pops are all right at the moment. Um, but you know, being 90, you kind of expect it to, to come and go, but we're good at the moment. Ah, Andrew asks a very excellent question. How do I structure writing when traveling? I don't. Um, so if it's a writing retreat, that's a different thing, of course, and we could talk about writing retreats at another time. I, they're a whole other conversation, I think. But I don't write at conventions. I can't. It's like two different sides of my brain. The side of my brain that does social and chatty and communication and teaching and all that sort of stuff it's completely different from the writer side of my brain. I'm not one of those writers who can write at cons. I do know them. I know writers who are like prolific at cons. They find them very inspiring. They'll go back to their hotel room and put down a thousand words or something. I'm like, madness. Uh, I cannot do that. I can edit. So I've done copy edit passes and stuff at conventions, but or more commonly on the plane but it, in general I can't. So I don't, unless I'm teaching, I don't even travel with my computer when I'm going to cons um, or heaven forbid on book tour. On book tour I absolutely couldn't take my computer because I'd be scared the whole time that was gonna get stolen. Uh, so I travel with an iPad, which I can set up to write to Scrivener if I need to, but I rarely do these days. Um, so yeah, I do, I will travel with my computer. So for example, this last trip that I went on to Portland, I actually ended up having like a whole day just in the hotel room on my own, which I could have written in, but I couldn't write. Uh, I tried, I did have my computer with me cause I had been doing some teaching sessions and stuff. Um, and because I was dealing with my dad and I keep having to do my computer, I need a proper computer for that. Um, but I couldn't write. So it's just, it's just a different part of my brain, I think. Uh, Writing retreats are a different scenario, and on writing retreats I'll write on like the plane and, um, and actually for me, uh, I can write on planes, so I can lay down, you know, depend a long for a longer plane or anything over two hours or so. You'll I can often whip out the computer and get some good words. I can't write a sex scene on the plane though. <laughs> can't do that. <laughs> I can only write like it has to be. It has to be stuff I'm not self-conscious if somebody reads it over my shoulder, because you know people do that all the time on planes. So like I have to be can't be I can't be writing a sex scene. I can't be watching racy stuff either. Um, so yeah, it kind of depends on where. Um, so yeah, so I so I kind of when I have control over my schedule, which I, I sometimes do, I'll I'll sometimes not do events for a couple of months, and that's often because I'm trying to finish a book. And I don't want the flow of the book to be interrupted by flying and doing something for a week. So um, sometimes I'll literally structure my events around my writing rather than my writing around my events. Oh. Era, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, asks, do I have an emergency and sundries kit for when I'm traveling? Yes, I do. I, I call it the medical kit. It's a little kit. 
um, with uh, blister band-aids, highly recommended, you know, the padded ones. I mean, for me especially, because I'm trotting around in stilettos like an absolute idiot. I know, but I'm keeping them until I can't wear them anymore. I'm assuming at some point I will just not be able to wear stilettos and then I will stop. But until then, you'll see me in my stilettos. Um, so yes, I do, I do blister pads and band-aids. I carry painkillers and allergy pills. I also use a breathalyzer. I have a mild asthma, but I can get an asthma attack, so I have to have that with me. So yeah, I have a little medical kit I travel with. Um, my biggest piece of advice, especially conventions, is pretty simple. And I dole this out, and actually I have had people come up and be like, oh my God, Gail, you could not be more correct. And here it is. Are you ready for wisdom? Soak your feet. Soak your feet every night. <laughs> okay, here's the deal. Um, when you're pounding the pavement at a con, it is the worst. It is concrete. It is hard. Those convention centers are wicked mean. It doesn't matter how comfortable your shoes are. They're brutal. So if you are walking convention floors, if you're running from meeting room to meeting room, your feet are going to hurt so badly at the end of the night. The absolute best thing you can do for them is to soak them in as hot a water as you can take in the evening for 20 minutes. Do it while you're brushing and flossing your teeth, whatever it takes, you know, as part of your shower routine if you're gonna do it. I have been absolutely for schnickered, like drunk as a freaking skunk and climbed up on a, maybe don't do this at home, <laughs> maybe don't take this part of, but I have climbed up on a hotel counter in order to soak my feet in the sink because they didn't have the ability to do so because there was no bathtub. But if you, if at all possible, soak your feet. 20 minutes, hottest water you can take. Um, that's, I mean, I also would recommend then, you know, giving your feet a little massage and a rub in with some of the hotel body lotion or whatever. Um, it, it will, it leaps and bounds. It will make it, it'll make you able to walk the next day. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great convention hack. Um, and I, I never hear people recommend that one. So that's my biggest one. Um, but yeah, so it is my feet that hurt the most at cons. So it answer to your emergency question. Yeah. Um, but in general, I do have a little, basically a tiny med kit that I carry with me. I don't always have it on me, but I do always have allergy pills and uh, medication on me. So um, if you see me at a con and you're in desperate need, uh, I usually have those two things uh, and it can help you out. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I also carry things like breath mints. I try to carry water and that sort of stuff. Um, scrolling through. Um, do, do, do. <laughs> Everybody's thinking about, I think, World, so Worldcon, for those of you who don't know, Worldcon this year is in Glasgow, but next year is in Seattle, and I think the Seattle event is going to be fantastic. It's my favorite, one of my favorite, it's probably my favorite, it's no insult intended. And there are places, there are reader cities I haven't been to, like Philadelphia, but Seattle is a very much a reader city, all the rain, I think. Um, so is Portland. But uh, the Seattle cons tend to be great. I really like their Comic Con as well, Emerald City. Um, but I, uh, I think the Seattle World Con is going to be pretty spectacular. So, and I know a lot of awesome authors who are going to be there. I will definitely be there. I love Seattle and it's really easy for me to get to. So I'm definitely going to be at the Seattle World Con. I, I would recommend if you're any at any way able to get there that that's probably going to be the a great world con um so i'm really looking forward to it fingers crossed um it, world cons are organized by different people every time so you never know exactly what you're in for but i also really like the seattle convention center it's kind of walking distance from everything but it's it's really convenient it's like a super convenient convention center you can take the light rail from the airport to get there um yeah i love it it, it seattle's gonna have, it's gonna be fun it's gonna be a blast so if you can work it I would recommend some Seattle World Con. Uh, Jesse asked, what's my go-to travel meal? Oh my God. Okay, whoop, sorry. Uh, this is very important. Uh, <laughs> I think Piper and I have talked about this on 20 Minute Delay, which is our travel podcast, but frequent travelers. Here's a couple of things that some of us do um, in my conversations with other frequent travelers, <laughs> which I do a lot. I like talking about traveling and food, so this comes up. Um, Many of us have a food we eat before we fly or that we travel with when we fly, and then a food we eat as soon as we get back. 
So most of the time, all things being equal, my food I eat before I fly is Mexican food because I am in California and it's very difficult to find California style Mexican food outside of the Bay Area in particular. I don't even like what LA or Heaven for Fun San Diego does to their burritos. So I'm, I'm definitely a California Mexican food girl, which yeah. So I need to have that. I usually travel with a burrito. I call this the burrito protocol. And for a while there, when I was traveling a lot, a lot out of um, Oakland, they called me the burrito girl because they got so used to that big fat burrito, that baby, baby burrito going, going through TSA that I got a nickname. Anyway, uh, so, and then when I land back here at home, I usually get Thai food. Um, and that's what I eat to make me feel like I'm home again, I guess. It's a strange thing, but there it is. Um, yeah, and I have very specific things that I order in order to feel comfortable and feel like I'm back and get myself re-registered. When I was excavating regularly, it would really depend on what I couldn't eat at site. So when I was excavating in Peru, for example, you couldn't have um, any vegetables that needed to be washed. So no leafy green vegetables, for example. So you can eat things that were peeled, peeled vegetables, but you couldn't eat like spinach or anything like that. So the moment I got home, I would always eat like an enormous spinach salad or an arugula salad or something just because I was so desperate for greens and I hadn't had them in so long. Um, in, so I tend to not feel homesick when I'm away. Um, it takes a lot for me. And I think that's partly because as an archaeologist, you travel places for like two or three months. So it takes a lot for me to miss home. Um, and when I do, it's not necessarily food. I mean, it might be that I, even when I'm traveling, even when I was like in Thailand for a month last year, I eat the same thing for breakfast that I always eat, which is a piece of toast of some kind with Marmite on it of some kind. Um, and well, uh, it's Marmite, <laughs> no, of some kind, uh, it's the same Marmite. I travel with Marmite basically. It's, that's, it's, that's a long way of me saying that and tea. So if those two things are are there, I, you know, I never I never really miss home. Um, yeah, so I don't I don't go out of my way to. Although I do enjoy um, seeing what pizza and hamburgers taste like in other countries. Uh, I'm not emotionally attached to either of those foods. Uh, I wasn't really kind of raised with those foods, so I um, I like to see what other countries do with those foods and with breakfast foods often, um, just because it's interesting to me. Uh, so I will try things like that overseas, but. Uh, I don't really crave stuff when I'm actually traveling anywhere. Uh, Susan asks, what are my thoughts on crossover K-pop with groups like Varicella? Oh, we got a sudden K-pop question. Uh, everybody take a break while we talk K-pop. Uh, I like it. Uh, I think it's fun. I think, uh, I, but I like it in pop. I mean, somebody was talking about uh, one of my pop culture, like, a podcast or something was talking about when Pavarotti did that wave where he was appearing I think it was the late 90s early 2000s where he was like singing with like Celine Dion and people like that I think it's fun um it's like fusion music I like fusion feud I like fusion music people can do whatever they I mean fusion music I know is a special thing but you know what I mean right I like it when people are experimental and having a good time with art and pop culture um interesting things happen so it's not always successful but it's interesting to see um so yeah, I like it. I think it's cool. Okay, I'll return you. Um, have I tried Meals on Wheels? Um, I have not. I've thought about it. Uh, so my dad's a VA, so I'm seeing if the VA system will be able to help out first. Um, he's also a terribly picky eater, and he's still pretty autonomous in terms of being able to like heat up soup and cook for himself and stuff like that, but I'm definitely looking into it because there will come a time when he will need that kind of thing. Jesse asks, what's the best travel meal to have a conversation over at a convention? This, Jesse, is a very good question. So, generally speaking, when I'm organizing like a meeting with industry in terms of like my agent or, and everybody's at the convention in question. So at one of the larger conventions, it's breakfast. So if you want sort of uninterrupted chatter chat conversation of a serious nature with an other author or with another fan or something like that you know about a subject where you don't want to be disturbed then breakfast is actually the best one to do because not a, mo at conventions not everybody's up for breakfast it's usually pretty quiet time in the hotel so i try to organize like serious important meetings for breakfast 
that's not always, I don't always have that option. So when like I'm down in the LA area or Hollywood is involved, they never do breakfast. So it's always gonna be a lunch thing. So lunch is my second then. Um, the problem with lunch is it's usually pretty loud and chattery and you're likely to get interrupted. But you know, so you pick a venue that maybe is not the hotel, the big hotel or something like that. Um, dinner I find is gonna be more raucous in general so I, I'm part of a dinner club uh, or I used to be part of this dinner club and we would just go off-site but it was rarely it was just friend chatter it was rarely like industry chatter um, on, you know and people are kind of late to things at dinner time and get distracted by things everybody's starting to drink so I find dinner is less useful it's more fun and less useful so yeah, breakfast is actually my first choice. I try to eat breakfast at conventions just because um, I'm never sure if I'm gonna have time for lunch. So easier to get a big breakfast in me and then I don't have, I, 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 I don't eat a ton so I don't have to really worry again until dinner time. Um, so yeah, that would be my recommendation is um, try to organize breakfast meetings. Oh, is that all? Oh my goodness. Well, we can, oh, we have uh, about 10 more minutes or so. If anybody wants to ask any last questions, we can keep it on topic or we can veer off topic at this juncture. Um, this has been lots of fun. Uh, I hope I'm helpful. Uh, I hope I am encouraging you to go, go to a con at some point. They really are a blast. I mean, if you're at all into the social side of fandom, um, it, it is a good time. I'm, yeah, I love conventions. I mean, Obviously, there are always catastrophes of conventions, but I've been to put some pretty ghastly ones, I will say. No, I'm not going to name those. I'll name the good things, so I won't name the bad ones. Um, probably because they probably don't exist anymore. But yeah, I always have a good time at cons. Because, uh, you know, people are there to dis dispose to enjoy themselves and make friends and, and see authors and stuff. Ooh! Mari asks a totally random question, which is lots of fun, which is, do I change my phone background with the seasons? No. I change my look and my color palette and profile, and sometimes I'll change my Facebook image and stuff, but it never occurred to me to do my phone background. My phone background is my cat, because I'm a sucker for my cat, who's sleeping right over there. Um, Beth asks, how about my absolute don't do this at conventions when traveling? Ooh, that's really open. Like, to authors or just in general? Because to authors, like, don't hand them your book. Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, you can offer, I mean, you can offer them the book, but don't just, like, give it to them and tell them to take it. Um, uh... Don't do this as a convention. So, so, so that, that's one. I, I, I used to talk about the fact, I once reviewed, a uh, professional reviewed uh, for Horn Books, which is a children's book review magazine. Um, and I made the mistake early on in my career in saying that because it is helpful to know that I did that because it means when I talk about how to do pitch lines and, and log lines and advertising and hooks and things like that, I, I know what I'm talking about because I used to have to write book descriptions basically in 60, 000, in 60 words or less. So I'm really good at it because I was trained the hard way. Um, but it meant that people would like, literally, I had the thing happen that agents and editors happened, which is someone slid a manuscript underneath the bathroom door. And I was like, this is, this is not good guys. Uh, gross. Don't do that. So don't do that. <laughs> okay, please. Um, what else? I mean, overpacking is a big sin. I'm trying to think of like absolute do's and don'ts. I have a list. It's in the description um, below or above, depending on how you're watching this, um, which is like the top 10 do's and don'ts basically. But uh, one of the things I always used to go say for conventions is the three, two, one rule or not three, two, six, two, one rule, which is at least six hours of sleep a night, at least two meals a day, and at least one shower a day. So <laughs> six, two, one. For some, you can change that number to whatever suits you, but generally speaking, make sure you're hydrating, you're feeding yourself regularly, and you're getting enough sleep. That will impact uh, not only how you enjoy the con, but how healthy you are after it. So. You know, you want to take care of your yourself and your health. Soak those feet. Um, eat eat some eat decent food. Protein, people. Eat some actually good for you food. And uh, yeah, when traveling. 
in terms of like general traveling tips, I mean, my biggest hack as a, as a frequent traveler is kits. I highly recommend it. Um, I think you kind of have to be a frequent traveler to really invest in kits. So my traveling stuff all lives in kits. So I have like a medical kit, a toiletries kit, a, you know, a so on and so forth. And then when I come home from a trip, I refill all of the kits to make sure everything's ready to go for the next trip. Or sometimes I do that before the trip because of the length of time. So like medication and stuff like that, you're, you're going to be only a certain amount of time. But so most of my kits also work as a grab bag for me. So if something goes wrong with my dad, I can just grab my kits and drive um, or if there's a fire or an earthquake or something like that so um, they all live in my underseat tote bag that I use when I fly for planes um, so my so generally speaking I can just grab that so yeah you're, you're if you're a frequent traveler you're also a you're also prepared for an emergency in a weird way um, yeah so another big tip I have which is one from back in the Renaissance Fair is keep your expired driver's license in your convention ID so, you know, um, if you have a wallet or a lanyard or whatever that you regularly use for conventions, um, putting an expired driver's license in there can be quite helpful because um, you, 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 you can be, you'll still be able to use it because it has your date on it for like being carded at the bar and stuff like that. And it works as a basic ID. Probably not going to work for driving anything because it's expired, but um, I always do that. Um, I have Global pre-check, which I recommend if you travel international. I find it better than regular TSA pre-check and you don't have to renew it as frequently. It's every five years instead of every three. So I recommend that. Yeah, big tips. Kits are the big one. And then my other big tip is your underseat bag. Make sure your kits are touch sensitive. And by that I mean, um, so I put all of my snacks for food in like a mesh kit and then I put all of my um, Charging devices for my phone and iPad in a neoprene kit So basically I can reach down into my tote that's in the that's below the seat in front of me and by touch I can pick which little baggie I need to use at any one time because they're all different textures um, And then I don't need to be able to see it. I can actually do it with the tray table down um, so yeah, that's one of my big hacks as a traveler. Um, it, it takes a while to get all the little baggies correct, but now I have my little system down and I can pretty much just reach down and be like, where's the neoprene? I need to charge my phone. And I don't even have to look or see. I could do it in the dark at, at, a, at a midnight overnight flight or whatever. Um, yeah, those are, those are my big traveling tips. The other thing, oh, I mean, I have tons of them, but for international, um, the key for me is to get my stomach on the right schedule. Those of you who hadn't guessed, I am very stomach oriented. So um, the moment I hit the final flight, so let's say I did the Thailand thing. So for Thailand, it was a 13 hour to Tokyo, a nine hour layover, and then a seven hour. So um, the moment I hit Tokyo, I tried to put myself on Bangkok time. So I tried to sleep the hours at that airport that I would be asleep if were, I were already in Thailand. And then I tried to eat the meals on the plane at the times that I would need to eat them in Thailand. And by that I mean getting your gut and your stomach on the right time zone is, for me, the key to actually getting over jet lag as quickly as possible. It's actually, it is sleep, but it is also your tummy. So that's a big piece of advice. And I've heard other frequent travelers give that piece of advice as well, which is to try to time your meals in such a way that you're going to be eating for the time zone that you want to acclimatize to. Um, yeah. Uh, I also, I, use, I do use medication for sleep um, for red eye flights and stuff like that. I'm a super sensitive sleeper, so it's practically impossible for me to sleep on a flight any other way. Um, it's the only time I use sleeping pills, but I do use sleeping pills um, for flights and stuff like that and for jet lag. Um, so yeah, but that, I mean, I'm not going to recommend that. That's going to be everybody's own discretion. All right. And then Kat asks to see the dress. Oh, sure. Um, sorry. It's kind of, <laughs> I can't really show it to you because I'm sitting on a couch and the couch is against the wall, but, um, it's like a little seventies, um, polyester. It's like a little seventies Hawaiian inspired sort of, you know, how the seventies tiki thing was. Um, yeah, I like the color profile I you know I like this pink and teal and stuff so it goes with goes with a bunch of my different headdresses so um and it has a little pleated there's a little you can't really see it has a little pleated skirt um it's very cute uh you'll see me in it at a con I'm sure 
Um, and we're, we're, oh, we have four more minutes, so no more questions. I'm going to blow through the last ones. Lashana asks, how's the next San Andreas book? Oh, darling, it's coming along. Uh, I managed to lay in some words this week a couple of times, so we're, that's good. I have a Wednesday regular write-in now, which I am really trying hard not to miss so that I at least always lay in those words. Honestly, we're so close. I got, I got maybe two chapters to go. So it's coming. It's going to be, it, it, it will, it will happen. I promise. Um, so yes, but yeah, it's happening. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very delighted with it. And I just uh, found somebody who wants to dev edit it. So that's exciting too. Um, do I have a brand recommend? I use travel on for most of my kits. Uh, I have compression bags as well for packing, which I'm still not entirely sold on. I don't think you have to have compression cubes for packing. Um, but yeah, I use travel on for some of my kits, but honestly, I just, I'm always looking for the perfect size and shape and texture of bag. So I like, I'm always looking at like Ross and TJ Maxx, Daiso. If you have a Daiso, they often have cute little bags of different sizes, but also think outside the bag as it were. Um, so it doesn't, if the, the bag is designed for one thing, you don't have to use it for that. So like pencil holders and makeup kit bags like that long skinny shape is is often really good for other things like pens or what or, or um, lipstick or makeup or but but also tea bags or what have you you know you never know so like the makeup kit bags are often uh, waterproof so like they're great for tea bags because you can throw the tea bags in there and then a little like so like a gel packy and then say voila you have a little food safe yeah so Keep, think in terms, think outside the bag, as it were. And then a lot of these, these bags that are designed for like tech bags or whatever, you can actually use them for other things like snack bags or what have you. So just because it says it's for one thing doesn't mean you have to use it for that. Susan asks whether I consume books on paper or digital. I do digital. I have a Kindle and I read on my phone and iPad. So I like to use the Kobo app. So I keep some of my books on Kobo, some of my books on Amazon. I don't really use the, I don't buy new on for the Kindle anymore. Um, but I have so many still on there that I'm still working my way through it. So pretty much when I'm traveling, I never travel with paper anymore. At home, I do still read paper. I will read, occasionally I'll read arcs that have been given to me in paper. I will read manga because I like visual. When I'm consuming visual, I prefer to consume it in paper. And then nonfiction, I'll often read in paper because I just like to consume nonfiction. But I could squirrel in it. <laughs> I'm, I'm brutal to books. I'm terrible to books. I'm always dogging or earring pages and writing in books and things like that. Uh, I'm a monster. I know. Uh, I think it's because I'm an author. I don't really care. Um, so... Yeah, but uh, when I'm traveling, it's just so much easier to have a little device with me. And yeah, since I'm almost always traveling with my iPad anyway, I'm, I'm on, I don't even bring the the e-reader with me regularly. Wonderful. Well, on that note, why don't we end on time for a change? It has been glorious to talk with you all. We stayed almost entirely on topic. Something new and different for us. Go us. Um, <laughs> Thanks for some great questions, um, some unexpected ones too. And I hope you consider going to a con. Um, I hope to see you in person at an event, those of you who I didn't just see in Portland. And I'll keep you informed via the cheer up and on the events tab on my website where I'm going and what I'm doing next. Um, and yeah, I mean, next, I won't be seeing any of you, but I am flying for an incredibly wonderful and auspicious event. I am off to officiate a wedding of one of my oldest and dearest friends um, from the steampunk world. So I'm super excited about that. That's my next traveling, all for fun. Um, but yes, I'm still thinking about Glasgow Worldcon. I haven't firmly decided yet, but I think that's probably, I don't know, I'm still 50-50. Uh, they need to tell me whether I'm on programming or not, because I'm not going to go if I'm not on programming. But any who's will be, um, goodbye, everybody. I will see you back here for the live or maybe in person sometime in the not too distant future. Take care of yourselves. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon or evening or I guess morning if you're in Australia. Bye.